Imagine that for years you've been saving up for this killer sports car. Dodge Viper, royal blue, convertible, just sweet looking sports car. So you go down to the dealer, lay the money on the table and say, I would like that one. He says, great, here you go. Here's the keys. You start it up, drive on home. But you can't, can't really drive anywhere because it's nighttime now and you're just saying, I got to get home, get to bed. But tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'm going to drive this car cross country. So you wake up the next day and go to drive the car and you look outside and some kind of weird catastrophe has happened. All of the asphalt roads of the world have turned to dirt with rocks and holes and you know little streams of water trickling through. And you go, no, I, ca I, can't, I can't drive my sports car. You try and first thing it does is kick up a big rock and you know take a big chunk of paint out of the side. You go, no, I, I can't do this. That's what it's like with deploying voice over IP across the network that's not ready for it. Voice over IP is your sweet sports car traffic of the network that you have to make sure gets there in the perfect condition. And yet, if the infrastructure is shaky underneath, if you're driving the voice over IP traffic across the dirt road, it's going to get rocky, packets going to get dropped, voice conversations are going to fall apart. So what I'd like to do is walk through two nuggets now on network foundations, preparing the infrastructure for voice over IP. I'm going to begin with a vision of what the network will look like. Kind of begin with the end in mind, right? To pull out a Stephen Covey Seven Habits uh, habit. It, it, we're going to look at where we're going and then look at the pieces one by one to get there. In this nugget, we'll walk through the power over Ethernet standards and voice VLANs. So here's a picture of where we're going. This is the adventure of this series, the vision, what we're going to build. What we have is we have a voice over IP network combined with the data network. Now I'll start with the bottom over here. You see all our PCs that are attached directly to the back of these IP phones. They're all going to be getting IP addresses from VLAN 50, which is going to be our data VLAN. Now magically, even though these phones are plugged into the same port as the PC, they're going to end up on voice VLAN 10. So even though these devices are plugged into the same switch port right here, we are going to be on different VLANs. Now that's phenomenal because it creates a security boundary between our PCs and the phones that keeps the PCs from invading the phone traffic. Now once we've, we've uh, configured that, these phones and PCs will come back over here and use this router which connects to branch offices as well as the DHCP server for both VLANs. It's going to be handing out IP addresses to everybody. The switch down here will be providing inline power to the phones to where they are receiving electrical current through the Ethernet cable um, and are able to power on and access the network and that kind of thing. Uh, we're going to have trunking for VLAN set up between our switches. We'll have something known as a mini trunk, I guess you could call it, between the switch and the phone. We'll also set up a Call Manager Express, Unity Express, TFTP server box over here. This is actually going to be one of my favorite routers, a 2801 router. We're going to connect that guy to the PSTN and also have him forward across the internet so that he can act as the data and voice router for the network all in one box. All of these phones will be signaling to that Call Manager Express box or Communication Manager Express with skinny signaling. Uh, SIP is also an option if you'd like to use SIP signaling, although that's still being developed. All of these standards, oh, one more thing over here, we're going to set up a VTP domain called Voice where VLANs replicate between the switches and so on, but all of these things represent concepts that we're going to be talking about. Some of them you may be looking at right now, for instance, if you've gone through CCNA, you've looked at the VLANs, you go, oh, I know what VLANs are, that, that fits, but what is this RTP, you know, where does this come in between the phones, what is skinny and SIP, uh, how does the inline power work, what is 802.3AF, that's going to be what we're doing throughout this series, is building this infrastructure block by block. I'm going to start off in this nugget by talking about the voice VLANs and inline power. Uh, in the next nugget, I'll be getting into the DHCP services, looking at setting up the uh, TFTP server on the Call Manager Express box. You know, all of these pieces are going to fit together as we go. Then, as we continue on, we'll look at configuring Call Manager, configuring Unity for voicemail, giving the phones extension. That's the big picture. Big picture is this organization, whatever organization this represents uh, on this diagram, is going to have a working voice and data network 
where people can call each other and the computers can access the internet and whatever resources they need. The first area I'd like to talk about focuses around the catalyst switch. Now the catalyst switch plays new key roles in the voice over IP environment and it actually performs quite a bit and it may require upgrading a lot of your switches to get some of the later and greater features. So the three key roles of catalyst switches are number one to provide inline power or power over Ethernet. These are really the same thing. It means that the switch has the ability to power a inline power or power over Ethernet ca compatible device at the end, which could be a phone, it could be a wireless access point, uh, it could be a video camera. Can't draw that one. There we go, a little video camera that's connected to the network. Uh, it could be, well, they even make nowadays, they're starting to make thin clients meaning like you know mainframe style thin client client PCs that can be powered via power over ethernet and the power over ethernet standard is evolving as well to provide more wattage and, and stuff like that down the line so the switch is able to send electricity over the wires now we're going to talk about each one of these specifically so I don't want to get too deep but remember every single Ethernet cable has eight wires inside of it whenever you make an Ethernet cable, but only four of those are used for actual data transmission. So what power over Ethernet does is use, let's say, you know, it's, it's actually jumping around between those wires for which ones are used. Let's say those four are used for the data transmission. Power over Ethernet will end up using the opposite ones. Now, I know there's some companies that either bought cheaper cables or took shortcuts when they wired the cable uh, and ended up only punching down four of those wires. That will not work with power over Ethernet. You have to have all eight of them going. So this gives you the ability to have a centralized source of power for your devices. Now that's awesome because not only does it save you the power cords that you have to plug in at each location, uh, but it's a centralized point of backup. People have become accustomed to the phone system working even if the power is out. It's just something we're used to over the years since the uh, phone company battery backs up or generates their central offices. And if you're using basic analog phones, nothing cordless or fancy, you can actually have a phone that works even if the power goes out. So inline power or power over ethernet will give you that same capability. Now, last thing I'll mention on this before, <laughs> this is supposed to be the overview, but let me just get a little deeper real quick. These two are actually two different standards. Inline power was what Cisco came out with first because they were first to the game with, with uh, power over ethernet sort of uh, methods and they had Cisco inline power which eventually became an industry standard known as power over ethernet or 802.3 AF. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So the second thing that catalyst switches are expected to provide are dual VLANs, voice VLANs, auxiliary VLANs, whatever name you want for them. There's, these are actually all names for the same thing. What it means is it's the ability for a catalyst switch to put an IP phone on a different VLAN from the attached computer, even though they're plugged into the same switch port. Now, it's a pretty wacky concept because we're used to assigning each port to a single VLAN. But now switches have the ability to handle multiple VLANs. They do that through what's the creation of what I would call a mini trunk. More on that in just a little moment, but uh, that allows you to have a security boundary between the IP phone and the computer by giving them VLAN separation. Uh, last but not least, the, the switches are expected to provide quality of service. Uh, and you can see I have class of service or quality of service. Uh, quality of service is the ability to prioritize voice traffic over the rest of the traffic on the network. And we can actually broaden that definition in quality of service and say it's the ability to pri prioritize any kind of traffic over any other type of traffic. This is the example I was giving at the beginning of the nugget when I said you bought this sweet sports car, but the roads have all turned to rocky mush. Well, that's, that's what the network is like without quality of service. You've got these rocky roads that the IP phone, if it sends its voice traffic over, it's just going to get torn up. So quality of service provides priority to that IP phone. See, it's kind of glowing there. So class of service 
is how the switch does it. Class of service is actually a marking at layer 2, or the data link layer of the OSI model, that allows the switches to see voice traffic and, prior and then take action and prioritize it above the other. Again, more on that later, this is just three major roles that the Catalyst switch now plays. Well, let me first focus on the power aspect of these phones. There are three ways that you can power a Cisco IP phone. The first is what I was just mentioning, inline power. Now, let me give you a little history of the inline power world. Cisco, as I mentioned, was first to the game with many of the voice over IP technologies. Like, they were there, they were ready to go, but there was no industry standard as of yet. So, some time ago, man, time flies. I, I remember when it came out, and I was thinking, is that eight years ago now? What's the year? 2008? 2008, that's about, it's about eight years ago, uh, Cisco came out, well, maybe a little less, maybe about seven, six years ago, with uh, Cisco pre-standard POE, and this is where the name Inline Power came from. They called it Cisco Inline Power. What happened was the switch would actually send a tone, just like, um, you know, the tones when you dial on a telephone keypad, a tone down the line, and a Cisco unpowered device would loop that tone back around and the switch would end up receiving the tone back. Any other device, like a computer, a server, a printer, they, none of them would loop that tone back and that's how the switch knew this is an unpowered inline power capable device, let me send power down the line and that's where you get the bzz, electricity going down and that's what keeps the switch from frying a non inline power device as it always detects it using Cisco pre-standard power over ethernet. Now about a year or two later, the industry came out with IEEE 802.3 AF. Now that was a great advancement because now we have an industry standard for inline power. It's not just Cisco devices. You can take any vendor switch and plug in any vendor power over Ethernet equipment and you would end up having a, a compatible match to where you could end up powering the device. So Cisco is in a sticky place because they now created their own little proprietary power standard and a standard one was released and Cisco's rule is we will continue to support inline power or I should say we will continue to support any standard because this goes across the board that we release for five years. So, you know, people, when they bought all these Cisco IP phones that only supported inline power, they start going, well, wait a sec. Does this mean that we now have to sell all our phones and get new ones that are the industry standard? And Cisco's answer was no. We are, we are not going to be uh, ceasing that for five more years. And furthermore, the new switches that they create will not discontinue this, and they, they still have not discontinued it to this day. When you buy a Cisco switch, it will support both standards. That's awesome because people, I mean, when you're talking computers, sure, you've got a shelf life of what, four or five years or so before that computer is quote unquote obsolete, you know, <laughs> Microsoft Windows Vista will come out and smother it because you need triple the RAM and all that kind of stuff. So you're, you're used to upgrading PCs, but not the phones. I mean, the phones sit there for years and years and years. You don't need to upgrade them. And so Cisco, thankfully, said, well, we'll continue to support both our pre-standard and industry standard for years to come. The second way that you're able to power Cisco IP phones and most power over Ethernet devices is through something called mid-span power. Uh, you'll hear this referred to a lot as a power patch panel. What this is, is a patch panel, it's one of these guys, that sits in between your switch and your power over Ethernet device, and the patch panel plugs into a power source. So that could be a battery backup, it could be anything. The benefit of mid-span power is that you don't have to upgrade all your switches. So maybe you've made an investment in all your switches for, for quite some time and you, you, know, you don't want to just replace them all with inline power switches. You can just replace your patch panel with these mid-span powers. The one thing I'll warn you for that, actually two warnings, is one, before you just decide let's go with mid-span power, really price out the options. Uh, mid-span power will be cheaper than replacing your switches, but when, you, when push comes to shove, you might be looking going, you know, 
there's not that much price difference. You know, to give you a rough estimate, you know, let's say the the new Switch would cost, we'll say stackable Switch would cost what, you know, fifteen hundred to two thousand uh, dollars for a twenty four forty eight port Switch, whereas the mid span power you're looking probably around seven hundred bucks or so. So yeah, it's cheaper, but when you're coming down to it. Is it really that much cheaper? And then the second consideration, remember, these switches not only have to support inline power as part of the new standard, but they have to support quality of service. They have to support the voice and auxiliary VLAN. So it's not just inline power that you're missing. You may end up upgrading this and then just realizing, oh, well, this doesn't support quality of service either. So now I'm stuck anyway. So really take those two into consideration. And that also goes for the wall power. Uh, the Cisco phones do not ship with a plug. And when you really price it out, you find out that the, the plugs, I, I priced it out for a uh, customer, the plugs are 40 bucks a piece. 40 bucks. Now I'm sure if you buy them in bulk, you may get them for 30, but still, 30 bucks a phone, I mean, you add that up, you figure you got a 24 port switch, right? 24 times 30 phones, that's what? Zero, two, carry the one, you got, uh, 720 bucks you're paying just in plugs and then you got to tie up the power strip at everybody's desk you got you know no no centralized backup for the plug for the power all those kinds of things so again I'm not I'm not trying to sell you a Cisco switch or anything like that I'm just saying really analyze all of these options and price out the best one for your situation Here's the summary list of all the Cisco IP phones that are out at the time of this recording and the different power over Ethernet standards that they support. Uh, I'm not going to go through them one by one because, well, it'd make no sense, but I would recommend taking a screen cap and printing this out because this, this list is one I assembled myself. There's no one place on the Cisco website that shows you all of this data. Uh, it, you actually have to go under each phone model and figure it out, so it took a while. So. Um, you can see right here, like some of the older phones, like the Cisco 7940G, uh, supports Cisco pre-standard only because it's an older phone, is one of the originals. Uh, whereas as the, the transition was taking place, like the 7941, you can see supports either one of those standards. And once we got to the newer phones, like the 41G-GE and the 45, now we've gone with the 802.3AF industry standard only. So if you're buying the brand new phones and you have older switch equipment you're gonna have to upgrade them to the newer inline power standard and eventually I can tell you in five years from now you're probably gonna see this list and it's only gonna have 802.3 AF supported phones everywhere um, but keep that in mind when you're buying switches uh, a lot of my stuff I, I have to uh, say you know a lot of my stuff I use for lab environments I buy it used and I buy cheap you know, if you're into the cheap labs, we're on the same wavelength. Um, but there was just uh, not too long ago, there was a, um, what was it, a 30, uh, Cisco 3548XL I bought off of eBay. It said inline power, 24 ports, and it was something like two or three hundred dollars and I thought oh that's a smoking deal not even thinking I'm just buy it now you know pay ship it and then of course I don't know if you've ever done this you do the PayPal thing and then you're like oh 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 wait a sec wait a sec and I go to the Cisco website and of course the 35 uh, it was a 3524 or 3548 I can't remember only supported the Cisco pre-standard and I thought oh you know so of course immediately I put it right back on eBay with you know inline power support and sold it for about the same price so anyhow always make sure of what standard of inline power it's supporting before you buy it now I'm when I say inline power I'm used to saying that, but the official standard and the, the term that we should both be familiar with saying is power over Ethernet. Um, a lot of times if you say inline power, people will look at you and go, oh, oh, you mean power over Ethernet? That's, that's the official term that we call 802.3AF. Now thankfully, there's not much to a power over Ethernet configuration. I'm going to bring it up here in the uh, access server. I'm accessing my power over Ethernet switch that is actually, if we go back to the network infrastructure, let me just show you that. This is going to be switch B here in our design. Uh, as of right now, switch B has no configuration on it, not even a host name, so you just have to take my word for it. This is switch B. And I'm going to type in uh, show power inline. You can see that you can specify an interface or just hit enter. And right up front, you can see the available power wattage on this switch. It's got an increased power supply, 360 watts. 
Currently, 29 watts are in use, and we've got 331 remaining. Now, normally in the stackable switches, Cisco will always equip the switch with a power supply enough to power all of the ports using inline power. Now, you can see that the inline power standard over here gives a maximum of 15.4 watts per port. That's, that's as high as the standard can go currently. Now, they're, they're coming up with new inline power standards all the time, so they're going to be increasing that, and that'll, you know, you can plug a fan into an Ethernet port and run that. Who knows what we'll be able to run? Actually, that'd be a pretty cool idea. But then over here, you can see the actual power drawn. Now, notice, I have, at, just based on this diagram, you can see Fast Ethernet 0 slash 1 through Fast Ethernet 0 slash 4 uh, has IP phones plugged in. This is the 7970. Notice this one's grabbing a little bit more power than the 7912, 7960, and 7912 down here. All these guys grab 6.3 watts because they don't have backlit displays. They're just a basic phone. That's great because we don't consume the full wattage per port. Now, keep in mind, Cisco uses, and I, I shouldn't say keep in mind, this is the first time hearing it, Cisco uses the Cisco Discovery Protocol to allow the Cisco IP phone to communicate back to the switch how much power it actually needs. So when the switch board initially powers on, it's going to say, okay, here's some power, go ahead and power on. The Cisco IP phone will communicate back and say, hey, uh, I'm talking your language, I'm CDP, I use 6.3 watts, at which point the switch will provision down the amount of wattage that's actually sent. If you are using non-Cisco IP phones on the network, obviously they're not going to be able to run the Cisco discovery protocol. So the switch port will typically provision the full 15.4 watts for that device. Now, they are coming up with new industry standard ways of detecting the actual wattage used per phone, but as of right now, it will provision that full 15.4 watts. I was actually out in... Um, where was I? Texas? Texas. Uh, setting up a, an Avaya, a voice over IP deployment. I actually was not dealing with the Avaya phones at all. Someone else was. I was provisioning a Cisco 6500 switch to support all these Avaya phones. And we actually found out as we were plugging in the phones about halfway through the switchblade, it ran out. I mean, literally, I was... You know, here's my switchblade on the 6500 uh, switch, and you know we were playing phone, phone. They were all lighting up. It was a happy day, and then somewhere around here they stopped. It was dark, dark, dark. Nothing, nothing powered on. And what I found out through quite some time of troubleshooting with Cisco TAC and so on was that we had actually exhausted the power supply somewhere around here on the 6500, and we thought, well, no way, we we bought enough of a power supply to do this. We, we checked it all beforehand and so on, but we found out that the Avaya phones were not communicating using CDP with the switch, so the switch was giving them a full 15.4 watts per port, which we had not planned on. Now, the story actually had a very sad ending. Um, there was a command that you could actually type into the 6500 switch to manually tune down the amount of power per port where I could type in, you know, give it 6.3 watts or 7 watts per port uh, and provision that. But the problem is that command did not exist yet back then. This was about probably four or five years ago. And the command, it, this is where it was heartbreaking. The command was in the syntax but it didn't work yet because Cisco had not implemented the functionality of that command. So I could type the command, but it didn't work. Uh, the end result of the story is we actually had to buy bigger power supplies for the 6500, have them overnighted. It was not a pretty story, but now they have that command. So life is good. So where was I? I was talking about the, uh, the power. Oh, yes, I was back on the uh, switch. So this is how you can see what power is actually being used. By default, the Cisco switch automatically has inline power on all these ports. Now there's not much configuration to it since it automatically does this by default, but just so you can see it, I can go underneath the interface and do power inline and you can type in auto, delay, or never. Auto is the default so it detects if it's an inline power device and sends power if necessary. Never says never use inline power. Now that's useful if you have uh, devices that uh, you never want to grab power from that port. 
maybe they're inline com power compatible, but they're plugged in. You don't want them to grab power from the port because you're running out of wattage. You can go ahead and, and uh, say never supply it on this port. Um, there's also this delay command. Uh, some devices uh, will receive inline power. Whoops, power inline delay. Uh, well, they'll receive inline power and then they'll reboot themselves. Well, they're expecting the inline power to stay there while they reboot, and sometimes the, the switch will shut down its power uh, when it detects the link going down while the device is going through a reboot process. So you can say, well, don't turn off the power right when the device you know, has a link down status. Wait a few seconds before you do that. So that's an option for you as well. Most of the time, you will never have to do any of those commands because the default state will just send power and power all the devices. All right. In addition to inline power or power over Ethernet, Cisco switches that are supporting voice over IP should, doesn't have to be, but should support voice VLANs. Now, before I get into the voice VLANs themselves, I know it may have been a little while since the CCNA program, I want to do a brief review of what VLANs are all about. Now, this is going to be a flyby version, so if you want the whole scoop, definitely check back into the CCNA course. But in the normal switching world, we have a switch where we have one collision domain per port, and that means uh, collision domains dictate how many devices can send at a time. So if you have one per port, however many devices are plugged into that switch can send and receive, if you're running full duplex, all at the same time. It's great. Best, massive improvement over hubs. We have broadcast sent to all ports. So when this guy sends a broadcast, it shoots out all the ports. That's how a switch works. One subnet per LAN, so all the devices on that switch are one subnet, and you have very limited access control, if any at all. These devices can access each other fully because that's the idea behind a switch. That's what you normally want. So the big deal about VLANs is it allows you to break a switch into multiple broadcast domains. It's kind of like the big transition when you move from hubs to switches. In a hub, every single port well, I should say the whole hub is one collision domain, right? So if somebody is sending or receiving on that switch, nobody else can do it at a time. One collision domain per hub. That was the big advantage when we went to switches is every port was its own collision domain. Well, when we break it into VLANs, we now can control our broadcast domains on the same switch. For example, just look at this switch right here. When we set up two VLANs, we'll say the blue and the red VLAN, a broadcast in the red domain stays in the red domain. It's like Las Vegas. Everything stays there, right? A broadcast in the blue domain stays in the blue domain. So this guy broadcasts, it comes out all of the blue ports. Now, the beauty of that is you now can control this VLAN. The blue VLAN stays in the v blue VLAN, and if you want it to get to the red VLAN, you have to introduce a routed solution. That gives you the ability to do an access control list and prevent certain blue people from getting to certain red people or vice versa. It's also a subnet correlation because each one of these VLANs is its own subnet. This could be uh, 10.1.1.0 and this could be uh, 10.1.2.0. And you can actually assign subnets to each one of those VLANs and they are their own IP domain. It can help with quality of service because I can say the red VLAN always gets priority over the blue VLAN. If push comes to shove and somebody has to get dropped, it's going to be someone from the blue VLAN. They're lower priority than the red. So this gives you the ability to logically group your users together, to give access control for your users, and to you know, really give better control over your network. VLANs, without a doubt, have changed the world. Now, VLANs have the ability to transcend switches. And this is one of the big concepts we're going to get to. In voice VLANs, they can move between switches. So I can have the red VLAN on this switch, red up here, red down here. So when somebody on the red VLAN sends a broadcast, it comes out all the red ports on every single switch that has red ports because they pass through switches. Same thing whoops, with the blue VLAN. If you send a broadcast on the blue VLAN, it comes out all the blue ports on all the switches because it transcends switches. That leads to the discussion of, well, what VLAN is this port a member of between the switches? Answer, all of them. Well, at least in this case. All VLANs pa pass across that, and that's what we know as a trunk. A trunk port carries all VLANs. Other vendors call this a 
tagged port, which I actually like that term better because it really describes what happens. When you send a packet in on the red VLAN, we'll, and yeah, I'm using colors here, but they're actually numbers. We'll say the red VLAN is actually VLAN 10. The switch adds a tag to that. So you have your red, let's say that red guy sent a broadcast as his data. It puts a little tag on the front of that that says this belongs to the red VLAN. Now before it ever sends a packet out any one of those red ports, it removes the tag. So the, the um, PC never really knows what VLAN it belongs to. It's, it just gets a tagless port. But when it goes over the trunk port, it keeps that little tag on there that says you are a member of VLAN 10. So this guy gets in and goes, oh, it's VLAN 10. I'll strip the tag and send it out there, but then send it down here and keep the tag on there. This is for VLAN 10. So VLAN 10 comes out here, removes the tag on each one of those. So keep in mind, this is a tagged port. Tag, tag, tag. Keep that, you know, the tag stays on the packet. So the big benefit of VLANs was that you can now have segmentation of users without routers. It's essentially layer two segmentation to where the switch can break apart the users into different logical groups. You can put access control between those groups as you start to look at routing. Gives you tighter control of broadcast. And when we start getting to our IP phone, gives us a whole new level of access control that's necessary. All right, that was the ultimate flyby review of what VLANs are all about. Now, let's apply this to IP phones and talk about voice or auxiliary VLANs. Th these are two names for the same thing. Uh, in the Cisco realm, what I found is that usually if you're on one of the native iOS switches, the ones that use the router-like iOS, uh, that'll be called a voice VLAN. If you're on one of the old CAT OSs or Catalyst operating system switches, they refer to it as an auxiliary VLAN. Either way, the concept is the same because general network design and security dictates voice and data separation. You want the PC and the phone to be separated with an access list to where the PC is unable to reach the phone. There are already programs out there, uh, one of the most famous ones, or popular ones I should say now, it's not really famous, it's called Vomit. I know, kind of strange. stands for Voice Over Misconfigured IP Telephony. Uh, what it does is it actually is able to take a packet capture or sniff the IP phone traffic and convert the codec or the, the audio that's going across the wire into a WAV file, which you can then you know, email to people. It's, it's like, you remember in the... Um, telephony days, the, the old legacy days, with they, we had things called butt sets. And again, I got to get away from the old days. It's, people still have these and people still use them. Butt sets allows you to take alligator clips and clip onto phone wires and you're, you're essentially tapped into the phone line and you can hear what's going on. This is your wireless butt set where you can actually tap into the phone. So we want to separate these guys. Well, how do you do that? You've got a an ethernet cable coming from the switch that plugs into the phone and then on the back of the phone you plug into the computer so I mean they're plugged together how do you separate them well what you do is you can use these voice VLANs what happens let me just clear this off what happens is the phone creates a mini trunk now we just saw in the previous slide what a trunk was. A trunk sends all VLANs between switches, right? Well, I call this a mini trunk because it only sends two VLANs between the switch. The VLAN between the phone, or the, I should say the, the phone VLAN and the PC VLAN. Here's how it works. The phone is able to support VLAN tagging. The technical protocol that's used to tag packets is 802.1Q. So what happens is when the phone boots up, the switch sends the voice VLAN information to the, to the phone using CDP. Now, if you think back to the previous nugget, I talked about the IP phone boot process. As it's booting, the phone or the switch says to the phone, hey, you're going to be on voice VLAN 10. And I think that's the uh, network design we used before. I'll just put VVLAN common abbreviation that's the voice VLAN so you will be on voice VLAN 10 and it 
then where am I going? The phone <laughs> then gets that voice VLAN and says, okay, any packets that I receive, I will tag with voice VLAN 10. So let's say you make a phone call. I pick up the phone, I dial Mary, I say, hey Mary, how's it going? Well, as I'm talking, the phone is taking my voice, my speaking voice, into thousands of packets going chop, 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 all these little packets. Every single one of those packets is tagged as being belonging to voice VLAN 10. So when the switch gets it, it goes, oh great, you're on the voice VLAN. Now the computer, let's turn our focus here, right? The computer does not know about tagging packets. It's a PC. It doesn't know about VLANs. It just sends data like it always has. You're surfing the web, you're you know, accessing databases, all that kind of stuff. So it's sending packets that have no tags. They're flowing through the, the phone into the switch as untagged packets, which the switch will then apply to the access VLAN. Whatever VLAN you set up normally on that switch, known as the access VLAN, will be a, uh, applied to those tag packets. So now we get two packets, or two different VLANs, on every single switch, immediately allowing us to separate them as soon as they get into that device. They're separate subnets. This guy's on one subnet, this guy's on another. So if this guy wants to reach, if, if the PC wants to reach the phone, it has to go into the switch to the router, you know, say the router's up here, the router then would route it back around and then say, here you are, you can now access VLAN 10. But remember, we don't want that. So on the router, we put an access list saying VLAN 50, which is our data VLAN over here, is unable to access VLAN 10. That's the concept behind a voice VLAN. Now, early on, let me clear all my scribbles off here. Early on, the only way to configure this was to set up a trunk. I would actually uh, configure the switch with a trunk. You would, you know, and thinking back to the configuration world, I would go onto the switch and type in switch port. Uh, <laughs> you know what? It's a lot easier to type than than uh, write this in. So let me just get my typing window up. Sorry, I had to find my courier font. You can't type in non-courier font. Um, I would go under the switch. I would say interface FA0 slash 5, let's say, or 4 that's connected to that, that uh, IP phone. I would type in switch port trunk encapsulation uh, dot 1Q. And this is on the switches that support both ISL and 802.1Q encapsulation. I would then type in switch port mode trunk to enable trunking. I then would go in and say switch port <laughs> I'm hitting the tab key like it would complete. The tab key doesn't work on this. Switch port trunk allowed VLANs and I'd say 10 comma 50 to only allow those two VLANs across. I then say switch port access VLAN 50 to say the PCs on VLAN 50 and then the, the uh, um, Native VLAN, or I, actually, I would I could add this in there. There's there's multiple ways of doing this, but then I would type in switch port trunk native VLAN 50, which says, and the native VLAN says this is the untagged VLAN. And it, it, I know this is digging back into the CCNA world and of what a native VLAN that says if you get any packets that are untagged, it's on VLAN 50. The tagged packets will come in on VLAN 10. That was a pretty hairy way of configuring it before. So, and, and by the way, we can still do that. It's just a lot more syntax than is necessary. Let me show you the modern way of doing this. I'm going to go on my switch. I'm going to go under interface range. Well, you know what? This is a brand new switch. Let me do a show VLAN. Oh, oh, I've got them created. Excellent. So I've got this mystery VLAN 5. I'm going to delete that. No VLAN 5. But I've got VLAN 10, VLAN 50 created. I erased the config, but I must not have erased the VLAN database. So those are already created. I, and just for review, I could have created them. VLAN 10, name voice. VLAN 50, you know, same thing. VLAN 50, name data. And that will allow me to create those VLANs. So they're good. They're good to go. I'm going to now get under the interface range, fast Ethernet 0 slash... 0 slash 1 through 4, 
which is what my four phones are attached to. Two commands. Switch port, well, I'll say three commands. Switch port, mode, access. That says these will be access port, not trunk ports. Uh, the default mode on all the ports is switch port mode dynamic desirable. Yuck. Because that means it will negotiate a trunk or negotiate an access port depending on what you plug in. It's a big security vulnerability because some uh, not nice person can go into their cubicle and plug in a switch and negotiate a trunk and start attacking the different VLANs. Not good. So this is actually hard coded as an access port, not a trunk port. Now that's pretty wild because you look here at the old method and we had to turn it into switch port mode trunk. See this right here on the old method? So we're actually saying this is an access port, but I'm going to say it's going to access switch port access VLAN 50, which is my data VLAN. So I put them in there. But then I'm going to say switch port voice VLAN 10. Done. That's the new way. So if you look at this, I could take all of this. Shoop. And just say switch port mode access, switch port access, VLAN 50, and switch port voice VLAN 10. And doesn't that even make a lot more sense? It's awesome because now you just look at it and you go, oh, okay, so voice VLAN, the phone is on VLAN 10, access, the PC is on VLAN 50. Now, the cool thing about this is in the old way, we had to configure this, oh, grr. We had to configure this as a trunk port. It had to be a trunk. So that means if this, this uh, person on the com computer was an evil person, they could unplug the phone and plug their computer directly into that, do some tweaking and tuning, and then spoof as if they were a phone and access VLAN 10. They can actually access the voice VLAN. Not so anymore. Well, I should say it's more difficult. There's always more security vulnerabilities that we have to prevent. But now this is an access port. So if somebody unplugs the phone, the switch no longer detects the phone using CDP. I don't know if I showed you this. Let me, sh let me show you. It's pretty awesome. I'm going to type in show CDP neighbors, you know, Cisco Discovery Protocol, and you can see it's actually recognizing IP phones on, on fast ethernet 0 slash 1, 2, 3, and even 4. It's just one of my phones is rebooting. They're in boot cycles right now because I don't have any... Um, call manager plugged in to support them, but it actually recognizes the IP phone via CDP. If somebody unplugs the phone and plugs in their PC, the switch is like, whoa, you are not an IP phone anymore. You can only access VLAN 50. You're dead. You cannot, you cannot get into the voice VLAN anymore uh, because I'm no longer detecting that. So, so much easier in the new mode of configuration to be able to go in and just set the voice and data VLANs. Now, when I do a show VLAN, I'll just tack a brief on there, get a smaller output. You can see that both these four ports are in both voice VLAN 10 and data VLAN 50 because we have now a dual or voice VLAN configured port. Pretty cool. So I guess we could call this phase one of preparing the infrastructure for voice over IP. You saw the vision. The vision is to build a network infrastructure capable of supporting both voice and data at the same time. You can't have a dirt road uh, for your sports car of voice traffic. We then looked at the power over ethernet standards. We have both the Cisco proprietary inline power and the 802.3 AF industry standard inline power that Cisco switches now support both of them. The devices are all moving to the industry standard. It's just Cisco inline power was out first, so it's going to be hanging around there for a little while, but eventually will be phased out. We then saw VLANs for voice to where we can use voice, uh, voice VLANs for communication in our voice over IP realm to separate the PCs and or the data devices from the voice devices for security ramification. This is phase one. Phase two, we're going to get into, into, into the next nugget, and there's plenty more considerations we have to set up. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.